appreciate your coming on to talk talk with us. So, Dick, I gather that you've spotted over a thousand birds in the wild. What is it about birds that appeals to you? To some extent, it's just the collector's instinct, finding something rare and special. It works for butterflies, it works for wildflowers, it works for lots of things. When you see a bird that you've never seen before, that very few people have seen, there's a special thrill in the way in which we're a collector of rare books. There's a special thrill in coming across a rare volume in the back of a bookstore. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it could have been butterflies uh, equally well as with birds. When I was young, it was moths and butterflies, actually. I switched to bird. Mm -hmm. Is uh, what is the particular thrill you get when you're in the wild and you and you do make a spotting like that? Uh, just how glorious it is to see something of that perfection of form. It's something you've seen often enough in books, but when you see it in real life, you're impressed all over again with what an extraordinary creature it is. Do you have any uh, particular hi hi highlight point in your uh, bird watching activity? It's mostly the one and only time that I saw a certain species that I'll probably never see again that sticks in my mind. <clears throat> when I was about 10, I saw a snowy owl, which I recognized because I had Audubon's Birds of America. I'll never see another snowy owl, probably. Were you actually bird watching when you saw it, or is it a, a matter of contingency to use one of your words? Pure contingency. Pure yeah. contingency, yeah. Great. Do you have a favorite bird yourself? Not really. No? Well, birds have something to do with philosophy. It's not why I brought it up. There is, of course, the famous owl of Minerva that Hegel says philosophy is like the owl that comes at the end of history and uh, the famous um, winged soul of the platonic uh, myth of uh, returning back to its original homeland. But um, that's not the kind of philosophy we're going to talk about. Dick, you've had a... a, a a, an amazing sort of career in philosophy, and, and you have, um, in some sense, burned a lot of bridges behind you in your uh, development as a philosopher. Uh, and since time is limited, we can't go through the whole um, career from its beginnings when you went to um, the University of Chicago and then went on to get a graduate um, a degree at Yale, a PhD at Yale. Uh, your first book, as I understand, is A Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature that came out in 1979. That book had a, um, a huge impact, very controversial. Uh, for our listeners out there who, who might not know this, what exactly was the big stir all about when it came to philosophy in the mirror of nature? I think it was a problematic book for a lot of people because it seemed to cast doubt on the whole idea of analytic philosophy, on the value of the movement that had taken place in the Anglophone philosophical world since the days of Bertrand Russell at the beginning of the 20th century. I hadn't really intended it that way. I had intended it as a celebration of the work of my favorite analytic philosophers, Willard Van Orman Quine and Wilfred Sellers and Ludwig Wittgenstein. But I wrote about them in a way that suggested that the whole phenomenon of philosophy as analysis of language or philosophy as the study of language was now something we could put behind us. And people found this shocking because it seemed to cast doubt on the profession as such. I kept being asked after the book came out, so what is it you, what is left of philosophy? What, what do you want us philosophers to do now? And so on. And I didn't have any good answers to those questions. Had you spent a long time in analytic philosophy before you uh, turned against it, if, you, if that's not too strong a term? Well, I'd prefer to say I, before I began having doubts about it, I don't think I ever exactly right. turned against it. When I went to Princeton uh, as an assistant professor in 61, I didn't know much about analytic philosophy, and I had to bring myself up to speed very fast in the course of the 60s learning stuff from my colleagues who had all studied at Harvard or Oxford and knew about stuff that I didn't know about. So I got familiar with a lot of the issues within analytic philosophy. And then in my book published at the end of the 70s, I raised questions about some of the presuppositions of the work that was being done. And what are the presuppositions exactly which um, you find uh, 
it, it, we can dispense with now. Is it analytic philosophy's ambition to find a language which corresponds to the so-called true nature of reality and to kind of tack on propositions to the world? Was it this uh, persistent and still uh, persistent um, assumption that philosophy somehow is, is in the business of getting right our facts, our, our statements about the world? No, analytic philosophy began as a reaction against the attempt to say what the true nature of reality was. That was condemned as metaphysics and as an undesirable and impossible enterprise. The idea was that we, by doing something called analyzing language or explaining confusions created by misuse of language, we would put an end to metaphysics and indeed put an end to all philosophy by dissolving all the philosophical problems. This never happened, but that was what gave the the movement its glamour. Well, here, you know, I've been reading this um, little statement that's more recent on your part, it's the Symposium on Living Philosophers, and I find it, you know, astounding in 12 pages, a, a kind of uh, map of, of what has been taking place in philosophy and, you know, and what the state of philosophy is nowadays, and you... You do begin by distinguishing between analytic philosophy and what you call historicist philosophy. Some others might call it continental philosophy. And um, you say that analytic philosophy is still in the business of solving, of problem solving. And that there are two branches, uh, according to you. One you call the naturalists, and the other you call the quietist. Now, if I understand you correctly, the naturalist of the analytic wing. Uh, believe that there are a core set of problems in the history of philosophy which have really not changed over time very much. And they go back to Plato, Aristotle, and the tradition, problems of free will and, and so forth. And that uh, for them, the task of philosophy is to solve these problems. Whereas you distinguish them from the quietists, whom you say are out to dissolve the problems. Now, you use the word that dissolve before when you were talking about analytic philosophy, but is there this distinction between those who are still out to solve and those who are actually trying to dissolve problems? Yes, metaphysics was sort of reborn within the bosom of analytic philosophy. When people had been dissolving problems and exposing what they called conceptual confusions for decades, Eventually, they got sick of that, and they began saying, no, actually, we want to say what the nature of reality is, but fortunately, science tells us that it is roughly atoms in the void, that is, everything is made up of elementary physical particles. These are the people whom I, in that piece you referred to, I called naturalists. The people like me, the quietists, are the ones who say there is no such thing as the nature of the world. Science doesn't tell it to us, nothing tells it to us. The whole question of what's real and what's apparent is a bad question. You can ask about a real Rolex and a fake Rolex, or a real cream and non-dairy creamer, but you can't ask about reality in general. Real only has a sense when it's applied to something specific. And, uh, well... We, we can get into this issue. I, I sometimes, although I'm in deep sympathy with that, uh, the side that you're on, I also, uh, as a host of the program, maybe I'll um, try to ask some of the questions that uh, others would want me to ask of you. For example, why do you, why do you assume that there is no such thing as a reality out there that for philosophy as such, uh, which you can get at? But I, yeah. I, I think the main problem with metaphysics is that it's a game without rules. If somebody says the nature of reality is spiritual, as the heirs of the German absolute idealists said in the 19th century, and somebody else says, no, the nature of reality is to be made up of atoms and void, how are you supposed to decide a question like that? I mean, with, when it's a question of real cream or non-dairy cream, or we have some criteria to apply. The trouble with metaphysics is that anybody can say anything and get away with it. Uh, well, what do you do with the scientific description of the world? Because I heard you say that even science uh, doesn't give us any more accurate view of so-called reality than anything else. And here I, I, I'm referring to what you're uh, talking here about these analytic problem solvers 
who uh, are trying to ask questions such as, is there room in a universe of elementary physical par particles for such things as consciousness, intentionality, moral responsibility, moral value, etc. And you say that these are location problems. So what is the location, for example, of value in a world of par particles? Location is just a metaphor, meaning given that really it's all particles, why is it we're talking about non-particles? And this seems to me a bad question. And why is that? Because the only question is, how did we come to talk about particles? How did we come to talk about values? How did we come to talk about minds? There are stories, historical narratives, to be told about the emergence of various discourses. My view is that when you've told the story about how the discourse emerged, you've told everything, you've found out everything there is to know about the nature of mind, the nature of matter, the nature of God, stuff like that. There isn't a further question about, yeah, but what are they really? All that there is to know is the story of how the words are used. Does that mean that we're trapped within the stories that we tell ourselves? And that therefore becomes a question of choosing which story appeals to us uh, most in our, in our imagination? Or what flatters our, our self-image the most? I mean, wait, 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 at what point does storytelling also assume a set of specific, you know, rigorous rules where it doesn't just become um, a mere contrivance, a narrative you, contrivance. You can set up rules. The scientists and the physicists have rules for what counts as an acceptable physical theory. The mathematicians have rules about what counts as a mathematical demonstration. Academic art has rules about what counts as a legitimate example of painting or of poetry. You know, rules you can always construct if you want them. The philosopher's idea since Plato has been that there's a sort of set of super rules that enables us to tell bad rules from good rules. That is to tell bad human social practices from good social human practices, good human social practices. I don't think there's anything like that. Couldn't the analytic philosopher, the problem solving, the naturalist analytic philosopher say, well, we also have our own rules in analytic philosophy about how you go about solving problems. And um, these are our rules. The, I think the, the trouble with that response would be that the, prob, the so-called problems of analytic philosophy keep changing with each generation. That is, it's, it's given rise to a literature that goes out of date every 10 or 20 years. So everybody throws themselves into solving the great new problem that Professor So-and-so at Princeton or Keller Berkeley or somewhere has come up with. Then they discuss it for 10 years, and then nobody can ever remember what the problem was supposed to be, and they go on to the next great new problem that's been discovered by a professor somewhere else. They're all supposed to be the true problems that philosophers have really, had they but known it, been working on all the time. But there's never any real justification for the claim that's what people have always worried about. So when we look at the, the quietists on this side of the equation, you, uh, you're comfortable identifying yourself with that group, the so the quietists who uh, want to dissolve certain problems in the history of philosophy rather than solve them, is that correct? Yeah, but it's not an animus against problems generally. It's an animus against a certain set of problems that have become, to my mind, cliche and textbook and obsolete. Free will versus determinism, mind and matter, the place of value in a world of fact, that kind of thing. Does the problem of human existence uh, in a world which, where, as far as we know, there's uh, no way that, that we can humanize the cosmos as a whole or that uh, our uh, specific kind of manner of being in the world seems to be rather exceptional in the order of nature? And uh, do you find that maybe something like a kind of loneliness that human beings might feel in, in their very humanity and, and, and the alien, the sense of estrangement uh, by virtue of the fact that there are no really, that we don't have any immediate uh, cousins in, in the animal kingdom. There are no intermediate species between the human and, and our next closest uh, you know, primate uh, relatives. That, uh, does the sort of unease of being in the world in our human mode is is that a false problem or is it uh... 
I don't think it's a false problem, but it's a problem for some people and not for other people. If you don't have some sense of loneliness, you probably will have no interest in either religion or philosophy. If you do, you probably will have some interest in it. When you go in for either religion or philosophy, that interest may survive or it may be eclipsed by other things. But it's not a problem that all human beings necessarily have, and the people who never experienced it are not subhuman or clods. They're just people with different tastes. Yeah, no, I, I can uh, I can understand that. But as uh, as Wittgenstein s says in the Philosophical Investigations, the world of the happy is not the world of the unhappy. And the world of the happy is uh, alive and well. And when one looks at human cultures, historically, globally speaking, it seems that there's hardly one on earth that has uh, not had a religion of sorts. There's the secular modern West of the last 200 years, which has created a secularist culture, which seems to me better than any previous culture known to humanity. And do you think that secularist culture has evacuated uh, the role of the religious or the spiritual uh, altogether? You think it's, it's, no, it's gotten, I think it's gotten beyond it, or, is, or are there... Are there um, I think it substituted hope for the human future for hope of getting in contact with another world. That is, I think we, we secularists lead, lead, if you like, as spiritual lives as anybody has ever led. But our focus is on what might come to pass here below in the human future rather than in our relation to reality as so. Uh, Great. Yeah, we're going to want to, I want to talk about that more uh, maybe in the second half of, of the show. But here, just to get the, um, the, the map straight, we, we talked about analytic philosophy, uh, naturalist, and quietist. And then this is juxtaposed to the historicist philosophies which you also divide into two, broadly speaking, two uh, different camps, which you call the reformers and the revolutionaries. And now in your last comment, I think you were articulating a little bit why you're on the re reform side. Right? The re can, can, you, can you just summarize a little bit what the distinction is between the reformers and the revolutionaries? I think of reformers as people like John Stuart Mill, John Dewey, Isaiah Berlin, Jürgen Habermas, who think that in the last 200 years since the French Revolution, human beings in the West pretty much discovered how human life ought to be lived. It ought to be lived as with as much individual freedom as possible, under as democratic a system of government as possible. The last word on human society, from this point of view, was given by John Stuart Mill in On Liberty. Uh, the revolutionaries are the people who say, this attempt to create heaven on earth has been a disaster, a failure. We should see now that something has gone terribly wrong. There is something radically wrong with modernity, radically wrong with bourgeois liberalism, radically wrong with the secular society, and so on. What does that have to do with philosophy, specifically? I mean, everyone can have an opinion on whether the, the world is a good place or, or modernity has been a disaster. Uh, whether we're on the right track or whether we need uh, radical revolution, why, why should this part, why should this be a, a problem that's specific to philosophy? As it, such, it, I don't think it's specific to philosophy. But a lot of the people who have written best about it are shelved on the philosophy shelves. People like the names I mentioned a minute ago. Well, who are the revolutionaries? Um, Zizek, Agamben. But you, Foucault, uh, the people who say it's all a sham, uh, we haven't really been making any great progress, it's all some kind of domination or oppression or something like that. Bourgeois liberalism is somehow a fraud. Well, let me mention a few more august names than that. Nietzsche, Heidegger, yep. Freud. Does Freud... I, I don't think Freud counts. Uh, that is, Freud, Freud, I don't think, had any hopes other than the usual bourgeois liberal social democratic hopes. Uh, Foucault, uh, sorry, Nietzsche hoped for the coming of the overman. Heidegger hoped for something, another age of the world in which thought would once again be possible, in which Nietzsche's last men wouldn't dominate the earth, and so on. 
What did Nietzsche have against the last? What? Who were the last men, and what did what, what disgusted Nietzsche about the concept of the last man? Um, the last men were, he said, people who have their little pleasures for the day and their little pleasures for the night. Um, people who don't aim for greatness, who have no conception of greatness. Uh, the reformers are the people who think it's okay not to have a conception of greatness. It's okay just to think about maximizing human happiness. Nietzsche and Heidegger after him thought that was an ignoble idea. Nietzsche said, "Not all men live for happiness. Only Englishmen do." Thinking, thinking of John Stuart Mill, I guess. <coughs> so it's fair to say that you. Uh... Insofar as you're a follower of Dewey, you say, pragmatist, that uh, you are therefore both a quietist and a reformer. Yeah, that is, I, I, I think that the development of bourgeois society in the last 200 years has put humanity on the right track, and the best we can ever hope for is the universal, the, glo the globalization of the kind of society we've managed to create in the modern world. That makes me a reformer. I'm a quietist in that I don't think that there are permanent problems of philosophy that need to be solved in the course of making that kind of life for humanity possible. Okay, Dick, uh, I'm going to now get in the uh, adversarial role for a little bit. How can you say that we're, get, we're on the right track when what you were claiming earlier in the philosophical realm is that uh, there is no such thing as a right way of getting the nature of reality. That, that you need some sort of criterion to say that uh, bourgeois liberal democracy is the right track. Why can there not be a plurality of opinions about what the right track is? Why can there not be a sustained conversation with a uh, diversity of contesting views about what the right track is? What, on what basis does bourgeois liberal democracy become... Uh, the enshrined sort of right answer for what, what philosophy should be occupying itself with. It's not that philosophy should be occupying itself with bourgeois liberal democracy. It's that philosophy should ask, what can I do for bourgeois liberal democracy? Uh, why? <clears throat> I don't think there's any criteria you can appeal to to settle the quarrel between Nietzsche on the one hand and Dewey on the other. I think you just decide what kind of future you want for humanity and work on from there. Yeah, but that... that <laughs> okay, that's a... Um, again, it's a decision that one makes to uh, embrace that thing. But here you say, I'm going to read you, all we need... <laughs> you say that... Um, this really jumped out at me. So, you're saying that you're a quietist for the reasons you escaped. We are also reformers in the sense that we think that liberal philosophy is as good as it is ever going to get. All we need is for the United States to get a lot more like Norway, and for the rest of the world to become a lot more like the United States. Now, there are a lot of people out there who might think that this is uh, grotesque as a the final arrival point is to make America more like Norway and the rest of the world more like uh, America. I might agree with you, but I'm trying to, uh, I'm hearing a number of uh, you know, voices in my head saying, well, uh, there has to be more to the story than that. Well, then let them tell an alternative story. What is it about Norway that's uh, make it so desirable that America become more like Norway? Uh, the the welfare state, um, social socioeconomic equality. They tell me the Norwegians have a law that if a firm wants to pay the chief executive more than five times what it pays the lowest paid employee, the, the company has to pay a fine to the state. That seems a great way to organize things. Sure, uh, we can agree on that, but whether uh, this is what philosophers, when they've taken the turn, you know, to the pragmatic... Um, to uh, to play out the pragmatic consequences of a philosophy that uh, you could say that uh, that's an issue that we debate day in and day out uh, among economists, sociologists, and uh, citizens and so forth and that uh, that's uh, to dissolve the problems, that certain problems of philosophy uh, to lead it on, on this uh, sort of mission 
to Norwegianize America. And to, and by the way, what do you mean that the rest of the world should become more like the United States? Do you, would would you would it be desirable to have um, all the various cultures uh, across the globe Americanize? Would there not would that not entail some sort of uh, loss at least at the level of diversity or, or certain wisdoms that go back um, through the, their own um, particular traditions. Uh, what would be lost in the Americanization or Norwegianization of the world? A great deal would be lost. A great deal was lost when the Roman Empire suppressed lots of native cultures, when the Han Empire in China suppressed a lot of native cultures, when, when the Mughals in India suppressed a lot of native cultures. Whenever there's a rise of a great power, a lot of cultures get suppressed. That's the price we pay for history. I take it you think that that price is not too high to pay. I think if you could get the kind of democratic society that we have in the United States universalized around the globe, you could having very little variety in culture would be a small price to have paid. Well, here I'm going to speak in my own uh, proper voice and and to really disagree in this sense that I think governments and forms of governments are the result of a whole host of contingent geographical historical factors whereby Western bourgeois liberalism or democracy uh, arose through a whole set of, uh, of, of circumstances that, that uh, played themselves out over time. And I think that America, a certain, uh, there's a certain presumption among a certain segment of Americans or of the American nation that uh, our form of democracy is infinitely exportable to other parts of the world whose uh, histories are profoundly different than the ones that had led us to this state. And that uh, regardless of whether you're in the deserts of the Middle East or in uh, you know, the jungles of Africa or in the uh, islands of Polynesia, that we can just take this model of American democracy and make it work elsewhere. I think experience has shown us that it's not that easy. We can't take, we can't make it work elsewhere. But people coming to our country and finding out how things are done in the democratic West can go back and try to imitate that in their own countries. They often have done so with considerable success. I was very impressed on a visit to Guangzhou to see a replica of the Statue of Liberty in one of the city parks. It was built by the first generation of Chinese students to visit America. When they got back, they built a replica of the Statue of Liberty in order to help try to explain to the other Chinese what was so great about the country they'd come back from. And remember that a replica of the Statue of Liberty was carried by the students in Tiananmen Square. Well, okay, but that's one way. What if you? Why can't we go to China and see a beautiful statue of the Buddha or something and and uh, understand equally have a, a moment of enlightenment and bring that statue back and and say that we have something to learn from uh, you know this this other culture from out there. And why why is the Statue of Liberty you know the final transcend? You you say yourself as a philosopher you don't that there are no absolutes. And that part of the misunderstanding in the history of philosophy is the search for absolutes. It sounds like the Statue of Liberty is for you an absolute. It's how about it's the best thing anybody has come up with so far. Uh, it's done more for human happiness than the Buddha ever did, um, and it some, gives us something. How can we to know that with? though? Too? How do we know that? I mean, on, what's some history? Well, for example. I mean, what do we know about the happiness of Buddhist cultures from the inside? Can we really know from the outside uh, that we're happier than they are? I suspect so. We've all, you know, all of us have had experiences in moving around from culture to culture. Uh, they're not closed off entities, invisible, you know, opaque to outsiders. Um, you can talk to people raised in lots of different places about how happy they are and what they'd like. You go on saying that uh, there is nothing rotten about bourgeois liberal democracy. Capitalism is okay as long as it is combined with liberal institutions like the welfare state. This is not a technological wasteland uh, and so forth. Uh, 
You say that Marx, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and Foucault are geniuses. We can be grateful to them for spotting things that are indeed distressing, but their overall attitude in their sense that there is something radically wrong is misguided. Now, even let's say that one accepts that. Uh, I've read writings of yours which seem to suggest that there are things that are profoundly wrong with the American Republic at present, and that it's in a crisis, that it's lost its way, that we are that our future looks bleak. In fact, you wrote in your book Philosophy and the Future of Hope, I believe it's called, uh, or Social Hope that um, you have this essay where you're looking at the 21st century from the point of view of the end of the 21st century and there's been a, um, a kind of calamity that's taking place in the western world in america there's been a collapse of all the institutions of this bourgeois liberal democracy and uh, although you give it a happy ending uh, that essay at the end in, in this hypothetical narrative you give it sounds like things are very wrong why could someone not come and tell you well Dick Rorty thinks things are profoundly wrong, but his opinion is misguided. On what do you think is wrong in the present state of uh, the political sphere in America? And, think, and how can you justify it as being wrong as opposed to right? First of all, liberal democracy has always been a very fragile creation. Philip Roth's novel, The Plot Against America, is described one way in which fascism could have come to America. Sinclair Lewis had a similar story in 1935. Uh, it's easy to imagine after a nuclear terrorist attack that we'll lose all our civil liberties overnight and <clears throat> the whole dream of liberal democracy will fade out in the West. The fact that it's fragile, that it's surrounded by dangers, is nothing against it. But do you think we're on the wrong track? I, until someone suggests a better moral ideal to work for than Norway, roughly. Um, I'll work for that. No, I understand, but the question is, uh, is there something rotten in the state of Denmark? In other words, is there something rotten in the state of uh, the American Republic at the present moment? Well, too many people vote for the wrong candidates, but is that exactly rottenness or just bad luck? Well, before... <laughs> Before coming on air, you, uh, I was, we, we were talking about that essay, uh, that hypothetical narrative from the end of the 21st century, where you give it a positive ending, and you said you don't believe anymore that in that positive ending. So it sounded like there's a deep pessimism in your mood at that at present when it comes to uh, to America. Well, my pessimism is largely that I suspect a successful attack by terrorists using nuclear weapons is probably inevitable. I don't think there's much that the government can do to prevent it. If that happens, all bets are off. And before 9-11, I didn't quite realize how likely it was that all, with all the nuclear warheads floating around the world, they were eventually going to be used on American cities. Now I think it's overwhelmingly likely. This is not the fault of bourgeois liberal democracy. It's just the, the fault of the nations of the world for not getting rid of nuclear weapons back in 1946. Does it have anything to do with uh, American capitalism and the kinds of ravages that it might have created around the world and the kind of uh, backlash it uh, might have bred in certain areas of the globe? Well, some people hate America for good reason people in El Salvador and Chile, for example, and <clears throat> at the moment in Iraq, just the way some people hated Russian communism in Poland, Hungary, Romania, and so on. Um, you know, if the Russians had been good guys, if the, Ameri if the Russians had always been good guys, and if the Americans had always been good guys, the 20th century would have gone very differently, and we wouldn't have nuclear weapons to worry about anymore. Is capitalism for you a neutral phenomenon, morally speaking, or is it, is there, uh, is it a, do, you, do you take it to be the most efficient way of um, uh, maximizing uh, economic wealth, even though it's badly distributed in capitalist society, but, do, you, but uh, do I take it that for you capitalism is not a problem in and of itself? Again, I think that it's the worst system, the worst economic system imaginable, except for all the others that have been tried. Uh, you know, 
<clears throat> nationalization of the means of production, state capitalism that was a complete flop. Uh, private property and private entrepreneurship seem the only alternative left until somebody thinks it was still a third alternative. When you talk about, mm, uh, you you give a you know very compelling history of philosophy about how philosophy has meant different things in different eras. Uh, so you say, for example, at, at the t in Plato's time, no one ever thought about changing the world. Therefore, what philosophy promised was developing an attitude towards one's life or living one's life in such a way that you could rise above the, you know, the immediate contingent realities of your situation and contemplate eternal truths, find some kind of um, spiritual <coughs> tranquility in, uh, in contemplation. But that if you look at the Middle Ages, the purpose of philosophy is very different because they're, they're, the task was to reconcile uh, Greek philosophy or the, uh, the, the legacies of Greek philosophy with Christian revelation. And so the philosophers were setting about themselves the task of uh, coming up with the synthesis between Christianity and Platonism, for example. And, uh, and that in the 17th and 18th century, with the rise of science and Galileo and so forth, and, and this discovery that the world of nature was not at all this fixed place that we thought it was, or this finite cosmos that uh, there was infinite space and that uh, the atoms and the void and so forth, their philosophy had to take on the question of, uh, you know, what is, how do we reconcile ourselves to this mechanistic uh, view of nature? And that led to um, this heavy emphasis on epistemology that you get in Descartes through Kant and uh, what can we really know for sure, this whole uh, anxiety about whether we can know anything for sure. Uh, and you feel that that was superseded in, um, with the Industrial Revolution and that philosophy now should no longer, although the analytic philosophers are still, in your view, tra many of them are still trapped in that epistemological 17th, 18th century uh, kind of mode, but that we, others have moved on to different things. And in, your, um, in this story that you tell, uh, we're trying to situate yourself and how you see philosophy, that now, uh, again, as we've mentioned several times now, the, the, the point is how can we further the cause of bringing about this kind of utopia of a social democracy in the world and including as many people within it as possible. And th this is where, uh, this is like, uh, this is where philosophy ends up for you. The question I have is, is uh, could we be at a turning point or can you envision something happening even sooner rather than later whereby philosophy now has a completely new vocation, which is to rethink the human in terms of everything we know about its the kinship of humans with the world of nature, with other animals, the fact that we are... Uh